Well, we do begin this morning with the latest on President Biden's handling of classified materials during his time as vice president of the Obama White House. According to two senior law enforcement officials familiar with the investigation, the FBI has conducted two searches in recent weeks at the University of Delaware. It is part of the ongoing probe into classified documents that have been found in other locations, documents that have been tied to President Biden. For the latest, let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, good morning to you. So first of all, what do we know? about this latest search and where do things stand when it comes to the special counsel's investigation? Yeah, guys, good morning. Well, we know that recently the FBI, on behalf of the special counsel investigating these uh, classified documents, has researched uh, several locations where they have uh, already found classified documents. These are places like President Biden's Wilmington home, his private office in Washington, D.C. We know that they've researched his Rehob uh, uh, his Rehoboth Beach home as well. So this was a search, uh, really a part of, of a check off of the to-do list of special counsel Robert Hur, checking to see if there were any any classified documents in these nearly 2,000 boxes that President Biden donated to his alma mater, the University of Delaware, back in 2012 uh, to make sure that any classified documents that could be there during his over 30 years in the Senate, uh, whether they are there when they shouldn't be there. It's still unclear whether there were any classified documents uh, seized from this search as a result of this search. Uh, but we do know that those documents that were donated were not visible to the public during the time that they were at the University of Delaware. So if there was anything classified in those boxes, it wasn't made uh, publicly available during that time. So uh, definitely a, a significant uh, layer in all of this, adding more questions that we, we already have for this White House in this uh, special counsel probe, guys. Allie, let's talk about another issue that's on the president's mind, and that's those unidentified objects that were shot down by the U.S. military. President Biden is planning to address that as early as today, according to our sources. Uh, what more can you tell us? Yeah, this is coming after major pressure from lawmakers, really from both parties on Capitol Hill, some of whom have received classified briefings about these unidentified objects that have been uh, shot out of the sky. And they say that the American people and they deserve more answers and more information from President Biden directly uh, after we saw just last weekend three unidentified objects shot down in as many days uh, out of the sky as a result of this. So this is uh, happening, as I said, out of, after major pressure. We expect uh, President Biden to talk about how his administration uh, plans to handle these un unidentified objects possibly being discovered in the future. Remember, on uh, Monday, we heard the White House announce the creation of this interagency task force to better communicate and coordinate uh, between military uh, government departments, as well as the leaders of allied countries, who we now know, since all of this news broke, have also experienced surveillance balloons flying uh, over their countries. So uh, right now we don't know exactly when this will happen, if it does happen, but this would definitely definitely mark a significant shift in how the White House has been responding uh, to these uh, these different discoveries and takedowns of these unidentified objects. And Ali, very quickly, one more note on the presidential beat, and that's his uh, annual physical exam today. What should we know about it? So this is something we've consistently been asking the White House about after this was uh, supposed to get done by the end of last month. Uh, the White House officials saying that this was delayed because of some uh, travel that was added to the president's schedule. It's significant because, uh, you know, they're with President Biden, currently the oldest sitting president in our country's history at 80 years old. You know, there are consistently questions being raised of his mental and physical fitness, whether uh, he is fit for a possible uh, next president presidential term if he decides to run again in 2024. Uh, we expect this to take several hours today. The results will be released uh, publicly. Uh, worth noting, his last physical was back in November, and his doctor gave him a, a clean bill of health to continue his presidential duties. Right. Uh, so we are uh, looking forward to seeing the results of this next physical. All right, Ali Rafa, thank you. Well, we're learning new details this morning about those unidentified objects the U.S. military has been shooting out of North American skies. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby sat down with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin during his trip to Brussels on Wednesday to discuss many of these ongoing questions. Secretary Austin saying there's still been no claim of ownership for any of those three unidentified objects. He's here in Brussels to meet with the Ukraine Defense Contact Group and his, his fellow defense ministers from NATO. 
They're here to discuss more aid in the, in the form of equipment and weapons for Ukraine, what they desperately need for the coming counteroffensive against Russia in the spring. Secretary Austin said that even though the U.S. will continue to provide more equipment in the future, the U.S. is not getting more directly involved in the conflict in Ukraine. Here's what he had to say. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin sitting down for his first interview since the U.S. shot down a Chinese spy balloon and then three other flying objects over North America. Has anyone claimed ownership of the last three? No, they haven't. The intelligence community now believes those three objects were not hostile, but Austin defended the recommendation to take them out. The safety and, uh, and security of the American people uh, is always foremost in, in our minds. The decision, he says, made because the objects threatened commercial aviation and may have been collecting intelligence. Objects like these likely over U.S. skies for years, but going undetected. Is this something that the American people have been potentially in danger from for years and just not known it? We don't know if, uh, you know, how frequently these uh, these things may or may not have have uh, appeared in our airspace. Uh, we're learning a lot more about that. The fact that the U.S. military didn't know about these until recently, is that an intelligence failure? Was that a military failure? No, I, it's, it's, it's how you use your radars. They recently made some adjustments on their, on their radars and opened up the aperture and they're analyzing the data a, a bit differently. Uh, we typically are focused on things that are moving fast and, uh, and uh, it, so it's a bit more difficult to collect on slow moving objects like a balloon. China today again insisting that its balloon flew over the U.S. accidentally and that in response to new U.S. sanctions, it will, quote, take countermeasures against relevant U.S. entities. Austin acknowledged recent tensions with China have halted communications with his military counterpart. When something happens, they somehow uh, tend to shut down their military channels of communication. I think that's dangerous. Uh, but it won't stop me from continuing to encourage them uh, to open up the lines of communication. I think that's the right thing to do. On the eve of the anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. is still providing weapons, including ones they once considered escalatory. And we now know the U.S. is also helping Ukraine with their targeting for some of these longer range systems. Back to you. Gordon Kuby, thanks so much. Today, for the first time, the public will get a look at some of the results of a Georgia grand jury's criminal investigation into former President Donald Trump. Yeah, a judge is allowing three parts of the Fulton County special grand jury report to be made public. You might remember the district attorney's office convened this special purpose grand jury to investigate whether or not Trump and his allies interfered with the results of the 2020 election in Georgia. For more, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. So, Vaughn, thanks for being here this morning. Hey, good morning, guys. What do we know about those portions that are set to be released? Right. There's a lot of anticipation for when the partial special grand jury report comes out because it could provide some indication about whether charges will be brought in Fulton County, Georgia, against Donald Trump, but also potential other targets. Funny Willis, the district attorney, has already said that there are 18 individuals who are targets of this investigation. So this goes well beyond Donald Trump. But we are going to find out three parts from this. The introduction, the conclusion, and a part in which the special grand jury outlines, uh, according to the judge, that there are witnesses who the special grand jury believe lied as part of their testimony here. What we will not find out are specific names of individuals who are included in this report. And we will also not find out the recommended charges from the special grand jury. But when you go through a report, despite the black ink that we anticipate seeing, there are probably going to be a lot of tea leaves that we're going to be able to extract to see just what sort of case the district attorney is going to be presenting so soon. Why is it three sections and not the entire report? Right. It was actually the defense uh, uh, and the prosecution that were both arguing uh, that the report should be uh, uh, private and it should be secret. And that was because there was scared on the Part of the prosecution, there was fear that it would taint the due process rights of the potential defendants here, and they did not want anything to get in the way of the case that they plan to make here in the months ahead against any of these indicted, potentially indicted defendants here. But ultimately, a judge who heard arguments from multiple news organizations saying that it was in the public interest to have this report be made public, and over the last three weeks, they've evaluated that report, and then today is where we're going to get out of that result.
So you mentioned District Attorney Fonnie Willis. The decision on indictments is going to be up to her. Do we know what she's saying about this? You know, Fonnie Willis has said that every step of the way, you know, she talked uh, about a year ago with our Blaine Alexander down in Georgia in an exclusive interview, and she outlined that as part of this investigation, she was going to use the full extent of the law to hold everybody to account, and that celebrity status, the fact that they work in politics, that was not going to keep anybody from facing uh, the justice system in Fulton County that she came in to oversee. And so that is the question. These are state charges here that we are talking about as well, and all of this stems from efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, there were more than 75 witnesses over the course of these, this two years of the investigation. And so all of this is mounting to potential state charges, which if we're looking down the road, the president, you can't pardon state charges here. So there is a lot on the line in this case. Indeed, we should find out more later today. Von Hilliard, thank you. Yes. Speaking of politics, let's talk about the 2024 presidential race. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley held her first rally yesterday. She kicked off her campaign in her home state of South Carolina just a day after announcing she was running. Haley is now the first GOP challenger to go against former President Trump. She says she wants to provide a new direction for the Republican Party and says that starts with trust. And I have a particular message for my fellow Republicans. We've lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. Our cause is right, but we have failed to win the confidence of a majority of Americans. Well, that ends today. Haley is set to appear in another key primary state. She'll be speaking to New Hampshire voters during a town hall later today. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now from Charleston, South Carolina. Ali, good morning. First, let's talk about, you know, any big takeaways from Haley's campaign announcement yesterday where you are. We heard just a little bit from her. What was her overall message and what can we expect at that town hall in New Hampshire now later today? Yeah, Joe, it's clear that she's shadow boxing with the only other person who's technically and officially in this race, which is her former boss, Donald Trump. She didn't mention him by name yesterday, but you watched the way that she tried to go one on one against President Biden, going after him on things like him being a leader of the past and stale leadership of the past as well. And look, if you were to substitute in many of those cases, as she was talking about the need for generational change and new faces of leadership, you could almost substitute Trump's name for Biden's at various points in that. So it's clear that while she's not yet willing to go directly at her former boss, this is the way that she's going to do it, Ch going at him on things that he absolutely can't change, which is the fact that he is in his 70s and she is a new face to this National Republican Party in her 50s. It allows her to sort of do this delicate dance that, frankly, everyone is going to have to do in this field, but especially the people who served in the Trump administration, like the former Vice President Mike Pence, like the former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, but also Florida Governor Ron DeSantis came up through Florida and national politics because in large part of Trump's endorsement. So all of these people are going to have to find the right way to maneuver around Trump, not alienating him so much that his voters don't want them, but also making it so that they can potentially pick up those voters as well. I, I would note in this case, it's not helping Haley immensely. Trump came out immediately, his campaign, marking the ways that she had said previously that she wouldn't run in 2024 if he were running. That is clearly where we are now. So things have changed. She has to offer explanations for why she's made that decision. But this is really going to be tough as a lot of these candidates thread the needle, Joe. So we know Haley is the first woman of color to run for the GOP presidential nomination. She mentioned gender during yeah. her campaign, campaign speech. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. This is not about identity politics. I don't believe in that. And I don't believe in glass ceilings either. I believe in creating a country where anyone can do anything and achieve their own American dream. So this is your area of expertise. You wrote the book on this topic. I mean, how does this compare to how Democrats <laughs> deal with gender on the campaign trail? 
Yeah, you know that this was the thing that I was looking for, knowing that Nikki Haley is only the fifth woman to run, run on the Republican side of the ticket and coming off of 2020, where we had more than six women run on the Democratic side. On its face, the fact that Haley is running just sort of helps to expand the paradigm of what female executive leadership can look like. That's really important when you put it in the larger canon of getting to this goal of having a female president at some point, just a more reflective democracy. But the ways that Republicans and Democrats deal with gender are completely completely different. Of course, candidates show up to the podium as they show up. It's clear that she is a woman of color. She spoke to that and has made certain nods to that over the course of the video that she used to announce, but then also in that campaign speech yesterday, noting the fact that she has been someone who has broken the glass ceilings that she doesn't believe in, for example, here in South Carolina when she was elected governor. She's using this argument, though, to say that while she is those things, that's not what she wants to base and steep her candidacy in. That's that's in large part because if you look at the polling, this is not something that conservative and Republican voters are really looking towards. They're not picking their candidates based on race and gender. That's true on the Democratic side as well, though voters there tend to be a little bit more vocal about, hey, I want to look to the women candidates. I want to look to the candidates of color for leadership on the Republican side. That is not the metric. They're looking more at policy and ideology. And clearly Haley was bringing that in spades yesterday as well, kind of a return to the past Republican politics, arguing over lower taxes, immigration reform, actual policy proposals. All right, Ali Vitale on the campaign trail in February 2023. Thanks, Ali. Well, this, <laughs> this morning, millions of Americans are at risk for tornadoes and damaging winds. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us now with more on this developing storm system. Hey, Angie. Hey there, guys. Yeah, we've got a couple of things that could be impactful through the day today, and it's for a large swath of the country. You can see snow falling in parts of uh, Nebraska, Iowa, and stretching into uh, parts of the Midwest here through the, the early morning hours today. We're going to continue to see the, these storms ramping up and the potential for some of these strong and even severe storms throughout the day. Here's those watches and warnings that have been in effect. We've seen tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings, and watches. And this is likely what sets the stage for us to continue seeing these through the rest of your day. We also have 31 million people that are impacted by these winter alerts, so winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings. Those are going to be on the table because we are expecting snow and a wintry mix, some of which I just showed you on satellite and radar. But this is what I really want you to focus in on. Uh, we have that, again, a potential for some strong to even severe storms. We dealt with this yesterday from the same system, and it went into the overnight hours. Today, we're likely going to see that, again, more more people impacted, 26 million, basically from from Cleveland to New Orleans, will have the potential to see strong uh, winds up to 70 miles per hour, some tornadoes, a couple of those could be intense, and damaging winds up to an inch. Here's where we have the best chance to see some of those stronger tornadoes. That means EF2 or higher. You see it includes places like Tuscaloosa, Huntsville, Hattiesburg, all on the table for you, and this goes into the evening hours. So remember, nocturnal tornadoes are much more dangerous than uh, when they're during the daytime. We we also have plenty of rain on the way with this system, up to three inches possible, stretched across places, really the whole eastern half of the country. Uh, and then we deal with the snow, two to four inches, up to eight inches in parts of northern Maine. So that will be uh, something that will cause a little bit of difficulty on the roadways. How about those temperatures, though? Is it February, guys, or is it May? <laughs> Yesterday, I had to check and make sure I wasn't dreaming. It was 67 degrees in New York, and it was delightful, oh. I've got to say. 66 today, 69 in Washington, D.C. We'll take a run at some uh, records for places like Boston that were set back in the early 1900s. It's, with the only wow. thing we were talking about yesterday was like, oh gosh, do we have to prepare to go back to colder weather again because it's so winter? <laughs> kind of. On Saturday, low 40s in some spots, okay. but that's normal, that's right? Bad. And then Almost it goes bad. right back up. So Don't right. put the coats away just yet. Exactly. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Well, now to some dramatic and emotional moments in a Buffalo courtroom yesterday as the gunman who killed 10 people at a grocery store in a predominantly black neighborhood was sentenced to life in prison. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis has those details. My brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre. In the courtroom, victims' families facing down a convicted racist gunman, showing grace. Do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. But also pain. You have shattered a lot of lives here, sir. Thank y'all for protecting There was anger. I will hurt you so bad. And I rage too me. overwhelming to bear. This was the moment the sister of 72-year-old Catherine Massey got up to speak. You don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. 
Her brother charged at the gunman. Guards quickly subdued him, while Peyton Gendron was ushered out of the courtroom for a few minutes. Massey was a woman devoted to family and community. She wrote about the need for gun safety one year before her own life was stolen by gun violence. Gendron, the white supremacist gunman, was convicted of killing 10 people in a hate crime targeting African Americans in a Buffalo supermarket. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. The judge was not moved. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. The gunman was given 10 life sentences, one for each of his victims. Now, if convicted of federal hate crimes, he could get the death penalty. Back to you. The Michigan State University community is mourning the students who lost their lives in Monday night's shooting. Yeah, friends, family, and the East Lansing community came together on campus last night for a vigil at The Rock. Many taking the time to talk about and honor the memory of those three victims, Brian Frazier, Alexandria Verner, and Ariel Anderson. We shouldn't have to live like this. We shouldn't have to subconsciously scan every room for an exit, go through the grim exercise of figuring out who our last call would be to. Our campuses, churches, classrooms, and communities should not be battlefields. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us now from East Lansing. And Jesse, wanted to get the latest on that investigation. There was talk about a lead on a potential motive here. What do we know about that? Yes, yeah, so we know that police here, Stephen, are still trying to pin down what might have been the impetus uh, behind this shooting. It's something that we do not have an answer to at this point. We were asking police about this yesterday. We know at least one of the things that they will be looking into, according to the police chief here, is the possibility of the suspect having applied for a job here at the university. But th at this point, we have no official word on any nexus, any connection between the suspect and this community. We are going to get an update from officials at a press briefing that is expected just a few hours from now. You know, Jesse, classes are not going to resume till Monday, but the FBI has been helping students, faculty, staff reclaim items that were left behind during the chaos. How are students feeling as they go back to the scene, and is the university looking at any security upgrades now? Yeah, and Joe, that will continue later today. This is Berkey Hall, one of the, the scenes of the shooting, according to officials. And just a few hours from now, students are going to be allowed back in here with the help of the FBI to collect what they left behind as they ran for their lives. And we talked with uh, law enforcement officials yesterday, and one official telling me that the items that students left behind are being left exactly where they were when the students fled, which means people are returning to pick things up right as they left them. And I asked one student about this yesterday, and he said it almost brought him back to that night. So you can imagine uh, how traumatic even days later coming back here and, and collecting what was left behind might be. We asked the university police chief about the possibility of security upgrades. He says he does expect that there will be changes here on campus, but he wants to make clear that they need to stick to their core mission here, and that is learning. All right, Jesse, also wanted to ask that we talked about that vigil that happened last night on campus. What were some of the themes? Was this more of a memorial or was there a, a call to action here or maybe a bit of both? Yeah, and the governor was there, by the way. So obviously there, there were political figures there as well as community members. Uh, there was not any really direct calls for action from the stage, nothing like that. This was more of a, a coming together event. There have been people who have been making calls for changes to gun laws uh, and also some people even calling for an expansion uh, of gun use on this campus as well over the last 48 hours. So that debate, as we often see, is going on. But that event was really more about um, memorializing the people who lost their lives, and, and there was some song and some prayer. Uh, we, we heard from uh, m several speakers, including the head coach for the men's basketball team here, Tom Izzo, obviously this basketball team, a focal point for this community. Uh, and we did speak with some people who attended, and a couple of the people we talked to said that something needed to change, uh, and, and people have various ideas about it. And one, one father I spoke with, an alum himself, his daughter, a student here right now, uh, said that, uh, he thinks something something has to change because even just one life uh, is too many to be losing. Uh, but that, that man also did say to me that this is what this community does is they come together. When you see thousands of people coming together, he said that's what this place is about, guys.
Mm. So heartbreaking to see it, but such a familiar sight at this point, unfortunately. Jesse, thanks so much. Well, EPA Administrator Michael Regan is heading to Ohio today to discuss the fallout and ongoing response related to the tragic train derailment that happened there earlier this month. He's expected to learn more about the health and safety effects of that massive fire that sparked when the 150-car train carrying hazardous chemicals went off the rails. The agency says it's continuing to monitor air quality in that area and has helped screen hundreds of homes for any potential contaminants. Meanwhile, a standing room only town hall held last night became heated as officials tried to address the concerns of people living in that community. The derailment has led to bipartisan calls for a Senate investigation into that incident. A letter was sent yesterday to the chair of the NTSB highlight, highlighting some of those rail safety concerns. Welcome back. It was yet another dramatic day in court for the Alex Murdoch trial. The jury, for the first time, seeing video the moments state investigators asked the former attorney if he killed his own wife and son. This new video released on the heels of the prosecution resting its case. Joining us now is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. So Danny, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So the jury finally got to see that video when Alex Murdoch heard that he was the suspect and one of the agents who was there at the time actually testified. Walk us through that testimony. The agent essentially authenticates the video, but the video speaks for itself. And Stephen, this is why two things are true. Uh, defense attorneys like me say over and over again, never, ever, ever sit down for an interview or interrogation, as we call it. And point two, as much as we say that, people still do it, including an educated lawyer who should probably mm -hmm. know better. And what a lot of folks don't realize, and what came out in this video, that not only can the police be coercive, they can even lie and deceive in order to try and extract a confession out of you. And that, ex that is exactly what the jury saw in this case. And the defense capitalized on it in cross-examination. But any time you see a video like this, it's usually really, really bad for the defense. Yeah, surprising, especially considering he is an attorney. And Denny, the judge ruling against allowing testimony about the roadside shooting that took place after those murders. Let's listen. I um, grant the motion to exclude this evidence at this time. Uh, of course, as we have seen, uh, things change. And who knows? So has the judge given any reason why he ruled against using this evidence? And we do know, do we know why the prosecution wanted that evidence? It's not excluded, Stephen. Late breaking news in the morning. The oh. judge excluded this evidence. But sometime during the day, the defense stepped on a ticking time bomb. It opened the door, according to the judge. And I disagree with this ruling. But late in the day, the judge ruled that because the defense cross-examined about some of the financial issues and uttered the words... Cousin Eddie, when Cousin Eddie was the person who allegedly came and uh, set up this assisted suicide, whatever you want to call it, allegedly. But because the defense uttered that name in cross-examination, the judge determined that this evidence, which was previously out, was now in because the defense did something called opening the door. And this is something that defense wow. attorneys like me live in abject fear of, why we tiptoe around cross-examination. But I got to tell you, this was something that probably surprised the defense. They had to go after the financial evidence. They had to question about that stuff, including the Cousin Eddie and payments to Cousin Eddie. But what the, the, the prosecution did, and they're clever, they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. As soon as you mentioned Cousin Eddie, you open the door. Now we get to bring in all of this attempted suicide evidence. And by the way, last thing, they will get now a jury instruction that they can consider that as evidence of guilt. Blockbuster, really bad, wow. and otherwise good day for the defense. Such a shift just from the words, Cousin Eddie, that's incredible. Amazing. Wow. It is a lot to follow. Danny Svalos, thanks for helping us break all that down. All right, turning now to those shocking claims against the largest for-profit hospital company in America. After a group of North Carolina nurses said HCA Healthcare was putting profits before patients, a neurosurgeon at one HCA hospital contacted us with some shocking claims of his own. NBC News senior investigative and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden brings us that story. Hello. Well, HCA Healthcare is the largest for-profit hospital corporation in the country. They own over 170 hospitals coast to coast. Last month, we did a story about one hospital that they own in North Carolina, where a group of nurses said that the corporation was valuing profits over patients. Well, in the wake of that reporting, we heard from a neurosurgeon in Florida who also works for an HCA hospital. He had his own story. 
Take a look. Stunning claims accusing HCA's Bayonet Point Hospital outside Tampa, Florida of putting profits over patients. Have lives been lost, in your opinion, due to the behavior of HCA? Absolutely, yes. That's a very serious allegation. It sure is. Sounding the alarm, Dr. George Janikopoulos, who's been a neurosurgeon at the Level 2 Trauma Center for 29 years, elected the chief of staff there 10 times. I love Bayonet Point. It's my home. But since the pandemic, he says the for-profit company, HCA, has been cutting staff and corners. For example, firing the anesthesiology team and replacing them with what he says are generally less competent people, leading to many errors, including one of his patients waking up during brain surgery. The patient was on head pins, which are very sharp instruments that put it into the skull. To hold the head steady. To hold the head steady. And I was just shaving the head when the patient tried to get up. So you can imagine that could have been tragic. So, I mean, that sounds like rank incompetence on the part of the anesthesiologist. It sure is. At an emergency meeting with hospital leadership in December of 2021, four doctors who were present say more than a dozen surgeons expressed widespread concern. I asked the question, do you feel this hospital is safe? And it was a unanimous vote from the surgeons that it was not. Then I asked him another question. Is the hospital dangerous? And that was, again, a unanimous vote that the hospital was dangerous. Neither the hospital nor HCA would agree to an interview. But they told us they take quality issues very seriously. That the hospital is appropriately staffed for the safety of patients and that they are continually looking for ways to improve. But according to Dr. Janikopoulos and three other doctors who spoke to NBC News, things continued to get worse. In January of 2022, we had 18 near misses in the operating room. Which means these patients, their lives were put at risk by mistakes being made in the operating room. Absolutely. As for the ICU, documents from state regulators show an insufficient number of nurses. Two doctors told us they believe such staffing issues led to the unnecessary death of a man who came in with a headache later diagnosed as an aneurysm. Unattended by nurses, he died before it could be repaired. When we look at the notes, it was absolutely not a single nursing note for 12 hours. Well, that's malpractice, isn't it? It's beyond malpractice. This should not happen. And there's more. These photographs provided to NBC by doctors show a shocking lack of cleanliness. From leaks in the ceiling, bloody and backed up sinks, to... There have been many sightings of cockroaches. One of the cockroaches was alive coming out of a tray that was presented to us from the sterile processing department. And the problems are not just a bayonet. According to the most recent federal data, 70 percent of HCA's 37 rated hospitals in Florida have a below average rating. It's not that HCA doesn't have money. The HCA has generated $16.4 billion in profits over the last three years. And its CEO has received $78 million in compensation during that period. I don't have a problem with a good business making profits and prospering. But when patients are dying because of your policies, I got a huge problem with that. If someone at home right now about to be admitted to be in that point, what would you say to them? There are other choices. Go somewhere else. Dr. Janikopoulos is still employed at the hospital. He is still doing surgeries there, though he tells us he believes the hospital is doing its best to shut him up and push him out. Back to you. Mm. Dramatic story, Cynthia McFadden. Thank you. We're back now with a look at the economy and call it a comeback. A new report from the Department of Commerce showing a major spike in consumer spending. According to that report, following a bit of a slump around the holidays, Americans more than made up for it in the new year. Last month, U.S. sales surpassed economist expectations, increasing by 3%, marking the largest one-month increase in almost two years. 
Joining us now is Investopedia Editor-in-Chief Caleb Silver. Caleb, good morning. Thanks for being here. So what do you think this says about the current state of our economy here? Yeah, well, there was a big comeback in spending. LL Cool J said, don't call it a comeback. But in this case, a lot of the December softness was pushed into January, where we saw a lot of spending. We also saw a lot of gift card spending, which shows us that maybe people got gift cards and maybe spent them ah. in January. But don't forget the fact that inflation was pretty, is still pretty hot right now. So are we spending more buying less? There's a little of that, but when you look across the categories, they're pretty good. Restaurant spending was good. Car dealerships were good. Department stores, which have been super soft, very good last month. And furniture stores, people are buying furniture again. So you can't ignore the resilience and the bounce back in spending, but a lot of it is because maybe we weren't spending as much in December. We have pulled a lot of sales forward in October and November with those pre-holiday sales. Interesting. And are they getting the bang for their buck? And PNC chief economist Gus Fauché actually wrote a bit about this, saying, quote, the increase in retail sales combined with the very strong January jobs report reduce concerns that recession is imminent. So what are your thoughts on that? Does this make us feel better about the outlook for that recession? Yeah, and you got to look at the categories and the, and the items we look at when we look at a recession. So retail sales through personal consumption expenditures, that's what we spend. Those are holding up. Those are pretty strong. Industrial production, kind of flat right now. Unemployment, as you know, very, very low. And manufacturing input, that increased last month as well. So you have some indicators that are really strong right now and some that are kind of soft. So maybe there is a soft landing. Maybe there's no recession, but recessions are felt very personally. You lose your job, your company goes out of business, something happens in your family, you feel a personal recession around the economy. It kind of feels like maybe we won't fall into one or it's just going to be some weakness. Maybe we'll see one down the road. And the Fed is saying as recently as Tuesday, though, they're not done with these hikes, that more needs to be done to combat inflation. What effect would that have, or, and is that having, on consumer spending moving forward? Well, we know that it's pushing credit card APRs up to record highs. They're about 19 percent right now on average, a little bit higher than that. So as those rise, it pushes people into debt. We know that December spending uh, payments for household and credit cards rose 5.1 percent last month as well. So we're spending more. We're also going deeper into debt. The average debt per borrower, right around five to six thousand dollars right now. That's mm -hmm. pretty high. With those high APRs, that could stretch the consumer. So the Fed's going to keep raising rates because all those other factors I showed you about the economy right now, they're strong enough where the Fed's like, we can keep doing this to keep pushing wow. inflation down. Expect another rate hike next month, maybe another one in May. Oh, they keep coming. All right. Caleb, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Well, this morning, we're remembering Raquel Welsh, the legendary actress, helped redefine what it meant to be a Hollywood star with her roles in One Million B.C. and Fantastic Voyage. In a statement, her family said the 82-year-old icon died early Wednesday morning after a brief illness. Joining us now with a look at her just so impressive career is entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar. Brian, good morning. Thanks for being with us this morning. So Raquel Welsh's career just spanned more than 50 years. She had so many major moments. I can just remember so many random TV shows that she would turn up in. Lois and Clark, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, just such a legacy. Talk to us about that. It's really interesting you say that, too, because she was one of those actresses that people wanted to see. And it started out with one of her breakout roles. You talked about One Million Years B.C., a film that she really only had three lines in. But the strikingness of her image on that film poster, that iconic movie poster, is part of what made her burst out. It was kind of a defining moment for her. She had done some roles before, and, and including a, a much larger speaking role just prior to that in The Fantastic Voyage. But was, this was one of those moments in the pop culture zeitgeist that kind of defined her as a bombshell. And this was an image that she would carry with her throughout her career. Um, she did, I will say, explore comedy. She went on to uh, receive a Golden Globe Award in 1973 for The Three Musketeers, but she always leaned into that bombshell status because in her words, you know, you, you can't fight an image like that. It is what she looked like. She was unmistakably and undeniably beautiful. A career that spanned 50 years, uh, Brian, here, and she really sort of redefined what it meant to be a sex symbol in Hollywood. You mentioned she did comedy. She went on uh, to be funny, had all, all of these roles. What kind of impact uh, is she leaving behind here? Well, you know, I, I have to say, we live in an age now where, as we all know, we love to talk about how people look, particularly as they age. And Raquel Welch is one of those people who looked pretty breathtaking and 
maintained that bombshell status for for eternity. She kept that going. I mean, look at her right there. I don't know how she, how she is there, but she's she she remained a, a, a sexy bombshell of a woman to the, the to the very last moment. Um, I think there's some interesting things about her that people probably don't know. You know, she was born Joe Tejada. She um she changed her name to Welsh after her first husband. That they kind of wanted. To- to uh, you know, Americanize her name at the time because they thought it would be difficult. They also tried to change the name Raquel to Debbie, which she uh, that was where she drew the line. She didn't want to be a Debbie. She said, "Do I look like a Debbie?" Right? And she also was incredibly talented musically. She went on to be on Broadway and and have a Vegas show. So I think she's she's a testament to endurance. She's a testament to beauty and um, being that Hollywood bombshell. She'll always have that as part of her legacy. Yes, so much uh, in, that goes into her legacy. I was just looking up on, uh, on online about all the things she's been in. It's just, it's hard to list them all. Brian Balthazar, thanks so much for helping us remember Raquel Welch. Thank you. All right, more financial news now. Twitter shifts its prohibitions on cannabis ads, allowing companies to advertise. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us now with that and other news. Good morning, Bertha. Hey, good morning. You know, we know that Elon Musk is fond of marijuana himself. He's often joked about it, but um, maybe that's why Twitter has made this shift. It's going to be the first social media platform to allow cannabis companies to advertise on the site in the U.S. Twitter has previously only allowed ads for CBD topical products. Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok still don't allow ads as pot remains illegal at the federal level. But, you know, more states now allow this sale of recreational marijuana. So Twitter is going to allow companies to advertise as long as they have the proper license and they can only target areas where they are allowed to operate. And as long as they also do not target people under 21. Meantime, Fidelity is hiring. 4,000 people for new roles by mid-year. This bucks a trend of rival asset managers as like BlackRock who are actually cutting jobs. Bloomberg says the positions will focus on customer service and technology. It follows a year of record hiring already that has pushed Fidelity's headcount to 68,000. And if you're waiting for that Apple a VR headset that gives you reality, well, it's pushing it back. Uh, the unveiling of that anticipated mixed reality headset from April to June, according to Bloomberg. The report says it's now scheduled to debut at the company's annual Worldwide Developers Conference. Product testing has found that there's still room for improvement on both the hardware and the software side. Apple has been working on the headset for years now, and it's been delayed several times, so we'll see if it actually does come out this year. Apple hasn't had a major product launch since it launched the AirPods way back in 2016. So wow. a lot of anticipation for yeah, that, although an I'm not a headset wearer. Right. And it, and it is supposed to be a little pricey, right? right? Is that sort of the theory that it's going to be a little more expensive probably than AirPods, I'm guessing? <laughs> well, I mean, that's usually Apple usually things are more expensive, but that's why I think they've really been trying to refine it because they want to get it right. You know, yeah. no one's going to want to spend 2000 bucks, for example, for something that isn't really spectacular. Get it perfect. All right. Yeah. Bertha, thanks so much. Welcome back. Rihanna continues to put in the work after her massive Super Bowl halftime show performance. The singer saw an almost 400 percent increase in digital song sales, along with millions more earned from her makeup brand and clothing line. But the music world is not the only thing she's dominating. After revealing she's pregnant with baby number two at the big game, Rihanna is placing her role as mother in the spotlight. She, along with boyfriend ASAP Rocky and their son, who was born back in May, are the cover stars for the March issue of British Vogue. You can grab that issue as soon as it hits newsstands February 21st. Those digital song sales, Joe, I know it says all of those hits we kept hearing, some of them I had kind of forgotten about, <laughs> came back with a vengeance. Yeah, Love no them. kidding. You're just such a great catalog. And Rihanna, work, 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 work. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stephen. We close this hour with new images from the ocean floor, giving us a rare look at the remains of the Titanic. The footage was actually taken nearly 40 years ago, but we're just seeing it for the first time now, taking us inside the storied ship in a way we haven't seen before. 
This morning, rare footage from the depths of the ocean, bringing a spectacular new view of the Titanic to the surface. The never-before-seen video was captured back in 1986, documenting the first manned voyage to the wreckage. The research crew making its way through the sunken vessel on the floor of the Atlantic for the very first time, discovering the bow, railings, and inside of the luxury liner. The ship's ill-fated journey was brought to life by James Cameron's 1997 Oscar-winning blockbuster. Flying. But the real story of the thought-to-be-unsinkable steamship was almost never uncovered after the vessel struck a massive iceberg on its maiden voyage from Southampton, England to New York. It took nearly 75 years to find the Titanic's final resting place two and a half miles below the surface. Robert Ballard led the team that first discovered the wreckage. I must say, to literally land on the deck of the Titanic was quite amazing almost just hard to believe. More than 1,500 people died in the Titanic's catastrophic collision. While their remains are no longer present, signs of early 20th century life can be seen throughout. It's sort of like their tombstone. And to see a mother's shoes and next to her, her baby's shoes. That's pretty powerful. The newly released footage captures the ship in the best condition human eyes have seen since it sank in 1912. Recently, scientists have discovered metal-eating bacteria rapidly turning the Titanic's remnants into dust. Last year, high-definition cameras were able to capture the deteriorating watery ruins. The famed captain's bathtub now barely visible. But the video captured by Ballard's crew rewinds the clock nearly four decades. It was really literally uh, entering a preserved museum, and the deeper you got into the ship, uh, the more preserved it was. Now this newest look at the 110-year-old ship is fascinating the world once again, allowing us all to join in on the discovery of a lifetime. And this footage was released in honor of the 25th anniversary of the movie Titanic. Ballard says the footage actually inspired James Cameron to make the film. Cameron even set up a private screening for the Explorer before it premiered as a thank you. When Ballard saw it. He said he was surprised to see how accurate the movie was and that he felt like he was getting to see the ship that sailed. Pretty cool stuff. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. That metal eating bacteria. Who knew? That's a little scary. But yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.